Uh, so one of the things we wanted to do, uh, achieve as the organising committee was to use the AR5 report as a, a springboard for discussions on where the science uh, and related issues uh, should go next. So I wanted to try and do that here in a, in a few minutes, basically doing a, picking up a few of the points of detail almost from my own chapter on land ecosystems and how that relates to some of the other chapters and how I see this may lead to some cross-cutting issues across other working groups uh, as well. Uh, so basically using the theme of interactions between global vegetation and, and hydrology uh, to, to put this point across. This is a figure from the uh, chapter three, the water chapter. So this is looking at the Im impacts of climate change on stream flow at uh, two degrees C warming relative to the present day. Um, this is something from a, a, a project called the Intersectoral Impacts Model Intercomparison Project, or ISIMIP. I remember when, when before AR5 started, I was talking to Chris and I was asking him what he wanted to see in AR5 compared to AR4. One thing he said he hoped for was for these kind of uh, uh, intercomparison projects of uh, impacts models has, has had already been done for the uh, climate models in, in working group one and that couldn't be done by IPCC but the community came forward and did IZIMIP and there was, I'll, I'll show several figures from that here. This is the, uh, the uh, IZIMIP study of impacts on stream flow for water resources and you can see it's showing the colours are the, the, the mean uh, percentage change in stream flow, so whether it's getting wetter where it's blue and dry where it's orange and red, and then the depth of colour shows the level of agreement between different models. I think there's about nearly a dozen models in this, and they're uh, driven by uh, different GCMs as well. And you see a complex pattern of change of some areas getting wetter and some areas uh, getting drier. Uh, alongside that, uh, the ISIMIT project also did vegetation change projections. So this, uh, this was cited in, uh, in my own chapter. There's three individual models here rather than the multi-model study, but it's, uh, the depth of colour here is showing the, uh, the percentage change in plant type composition from three different global vegetation models. So you can see, uh, again, the different patterns of change in vegetation in, across the world, and different models give different answers, but you can see, particularly in the darker areas, areas where these models are, are suggesting quite a substantial change in the composition of vegetation and ecosystems. Uh, now, the interesting thing uh, about this is that these models, the ecosystem and vegetation models, themselves uh, attempt to do hydrology, not, perhaps not as sophisticated uh, as the specialist hydrology models, but they do do that. So a cartoon here just suggests, shows the vegetation models will do input and output of water from the land surface, exchanging with the atmosphere, and exchange into the, the soil, the infiltration, and then simulating runoff uh, into the oceans. And this is all part of a vegetation model. So another study that was done within IZIMIP and again was cited within the, the report, but at a, a low level because it was at early, an early stage, was this, uh, uh, this study comparing the change in runoff from the hydrology models at the top with, the, with that, the same quantity from the ecosystem models uh, at the bottom. So I think there's 11 hydrology models in the top figure and four vegetation models in the bottom panel. And again, as before, the, the, the colours show the, the, the mean change and the depth of colour shows the level of agreement. Uh, and you can see, to first order, it's a similar kind of global pattern. You see wetting in the north and drying in the, in the mid-latitudes. Uh, but there's some regional differences. Uh, so, for example, in the, in the far north of Eurasia, we're seeing greater increases in runoff in the hydrology models than in the vegetation models. If you look at Europe, we're seeing a greater decrease in runoff uh, in the hydrology models compared to the vegetation models. Uh, so the, in those two cases, the vegetation seems to be, uh, in those models anyway, uh, softening the impact of uh, climate change. One area that's particularly interesting is in Central Africa, where broadly speaking, it's actually changing the sign of the response. The hydrology models are showing a drying, whereas the ecosystem models are showing an, uh, a wetting in terms of uh, change in runoff. So there's important things to do there now to understand more about that. Uh, we don't know which one to believe yet. Uh, so we, there's a, I think this is an important area of research to really look more at the in interactions between vegetation and hydrology and, and to get a more full system view. Another issue is uh, models driven by the outputs of climate models compared to what the climate models themselves uh, think is doing. Because like I said, vegetation models will include hydrology in a simplistic way. 
climate models themselves and earth system models again will do the water cycle, the full water cycle, including soil moisture and evaporation and runoff. So I've got an example here which looks at, uh, looks at this. This is, to start with, this is a, a study using the output of the Hadley Centre uh, HADGEM2 uh, ES model, uh, driving a, a well-known hydrology model which has been central to uh, uh, the hydrology assessments in IPCC and other studies, looking at as addressing the question in this figure, uh, is the land becoming wetter or, or drier? And it's the, the figure uh, being shown is the, the percentage of land which is undergoing a decrease in runoff for the different RCP scenarios by the end of the century. So you can see that in RCP 2.6, we've got slightly more than 50% uh, of the land is, is getting drier, and then that percentage increases as you go for RCP 4.5 and 8.5. RCP 6 wasn't done in this study. So we, you can see a drying climate getting drier uh, in this study. Uh, so an offline hydrology model driven by uh, a climate model. But the climate model itself, had gem 2 es simulates its own runoff as part of the water cycle. Initially, this was in there to try and uh, close the water cycle and inform uh, ocean circulation and the freshwater input to the oceans. But we're increasingly using it for land surface studies as well. This is the output from Hadron 2 es itself, the global average uh, runoff uh, for the different RCPs. You can see that, generally speaking, uh, Hadron 2 is giving an increase in runoff and a greater increase in global runoff for greater levels of climate change. So if we compare that uh, with the, the, the previous offline study, it turns out we actually get a, a different picture uh, in terms of the question of will the land become drier or wetter. Whereas the offline study was showing a drier climate getting drier, uh, the original model that was used to drive this offline model uh, is, is showing less than 40% of the land getting drier in RCP 2.6, and that slightly decreases as you, as you increase the rate of forcing over the RCPs. So we're seeing a, a, a climate getting, on the average, wetter rather than drier. So I think this is quite important, that you're completely changing the sign of the response depending on how you do it. Again, we don't know which is right, uh, because uh, hadgem 2 es doesn't have a specialist hydrology model. There's probably more issues to sort out there. But I think the point is, we're getting substantially different answers. That's an important area of research that needs to be followed up. So to come back to this picture, when you've got vegetation in a climate model, you've got interactions uh, between the land surface and the, and the atmosphere. Uh, rainfall and evaporation and transpiration uh, are affected by weather and climate. Evaporation and transpiration themselves <laughs> feed back on the climate. They affect the weather and climate. An important thing here may be, uh, we still need more work on this, but it may well be that this additional effect uh, of uh, directly, the direct effects of, of carbon dioxide concentration on plant physiology may be a key component in many of the figures I've shown so far. So under higher CO2, uh, plants tend to be more uh, efficient in their use of water, so you tend to get less transpiration uh, and tend to get less... Uh, more water re remaining in the soil. It varies a lot from species to species in different situations, but broadly speaking, higher C CO2 reduces transpiration, and that can affect the global water cycle. And that may be a key point in both of the two studies I've shown here in terms of the role of vegetation affecting the water cycle. And I think this was uh, a figure from... Uh, this is actually a cross-chapter box. One of the uh, key things in, in the Working Group 2 report was some... Uh, some boxes which looked at cross-cutting issues. So this was jointly in the ecosystem chapter and the, and the water resources chapter. This is showing the, uh, uh, the change in net irrigation requirements over the uh, century with and without this direct effect of CO2 on crops, looking at 11 major crops in areas which are currently irrigated and assuming there's current management practice. And again, you can see in many cases the inclusion of the CO2 effect completely changes the sign of the response. Um, at the bottom, if you ignore the CO2 effect, you get a large increase uh, in the water requirements for irrigation. But if you include the CO2 effect in the top panel, in many cases you get an actual decrease in, in water requirements. Probably neither of these is right. Probably the truth is somewhere in the middle. But exactly where, uh, we don't know yet. But it's really important, I think, to, to try and follow this up. But it's not just a matter of um, improving the understanding of uh, plant physiology. I think this is also more of a cross-cutting issue in terms of um, the implications of issues like uh, climate sensitivity and the greenhouse gas mix, if you're considering what CO2 does in comparison with the associated level of climate change and other greenhouse gases which don't have this kind of influence. So, just to come back to a working group one uh, figure, so Matt showed this figure earlier, uh, the transient climate response, the, uh, the, the uh, level of warming uh, that you pass through when, uh, uh, when you're passing through doubling uh, of CO2. So, Many studies trying to estimate 
what is that level of warming at, uh, at the time of doubling CO2. Uh, I'm interested in kind of switching that around and looking at a specific level of warming. I mean, Chris mentioned this in his talk about the difficulty of trying to identify impacts at particular levels of warming. But if you flip that around uh, and say, what is the CO2 concentration at the time of reaching a particular level of warming, say two degrees in this figure, you can actually get your, your inverse of the transient climate response PDF, if you like. This is something that we did from uh, a large ensemble uh, of the Hadley Center uh, system model. Uh, and it's showing that at reaching double CO2, uh, sorry, at reaching two degrees C, uh, there's quite a wide range of CO2 concentrations at that time. So if we have uh, high climate sensitivity, uh, and so we reach double CO2 at a low CO2 concentration, the relative effects of CO2 on vegetation and hydrology and irrigation and agriculture are, are quite small. But if, uh, if climate sensitivity is low, we have a high CO2 concentration at reaching double CO2 or any other level of uh, warming, so the relative effects of CO2 become much more important. So we don't know where we are within that range yet, uh, but I think this is an important cross-cutting issue to try and uh, figure out where we should where we should be focusing on this. And, and again, it's part of the risk assessment framework, really, trying to look at all these issues as part of the bigger picture. So to uh, summarise then, uh, the projected impacts of climate change on vegetation and hydrology do depend uh, on each other. Uh, and in some recent studies, the hydrological impacts generally se seem to be smaller in ecosystem models than in hydrology models. So we need to understand more about that. Uh, in some cases, the coupling with vegetation or climate models can actually change the sign of the hydrological impact, either at the local scale or at the global scale even. But the importance of the CO2 physiological effect, which may be a key part of this, uh, it depends uh, on the plant physiological processes themselves, but also on the climate sensitivity and how climate change relates to, uh, to the, difference, the CO2 concentration. Also, I haven't gone into this, but I think this is important to note that it depends on the... Uh, the, the mix of greenhouse gases, how much CO2 you've got compared to non-CO2 greenhouse gases, and that's perhaps a, a, an issue for the, the mitigation community. So I think there's related issues here for all three IPCC working groups, uh, and I, I'd, I'd really like to see more done on that in a more integrated way. Uh, and just finally, uh, Peter Stock plugged his EU project, so I'm going to do the same. Uh, we're looking at this, there's a new EU project called Helix, stands for High End Climate Impacts and Extremes. This is quantifying global and regional impacts of climate change at different levels of global warming, and we're doing this more full system view to try and address some of these questions. Thank you.